So today we've got an interesting guest, customer of Legendary Motor Car, Ernie Bach Jr. is an American billionaire, former CEO of Bach Enterprises, a prominent Trump supporter, and a serious philanthropist. He's got an interesting life story. You guys are going to enjoy this one. So, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate you coming up and sitting down and yeah, taking the time. Yeah, thank yeah, you. It's good. I, it's, it's beautiful up here. I love Canada. Of course. That's good. That's good. So I want to... Um, I want to start at the beginning of your kind of family story here. I've been doing a little bit of homework, and uh, I watched some awesome, awesome vintage car commercials. Oh. They're great. Yeah. <laughs> so, what? Tell me how. Your, was it your grandfather who started? My grandfather started. My grandfather started the company officially in 1938. Wow. He um, he came over. He was uh, second generation Italian. Okay. Uh, off the boat. When I was a kid, we had my great grandfather around who we were petrified of. All the kids were absolutely petrified of him. Sure. I mean, I think I only remember seeing him stand up once or twice, you know, he was wow. always in a chair doing something. But my grandfather started working at uh, Boston Cadillac okay. in, in Boston, Massachusetts. Now I live, I live about 17 miles south of Boston. Okay. But back then, 17 miles south in the, in the uh, 20s and 30s that was that was a long way mm -hmm. 17 miles so my father started working for boston cadillac he was always a tinkerer and one thing led to another and he was he, he, he got an official job and on the weekends he used to fix the neighbor's cars and my grandmother used to shag the uh parts and stuff like that and then the, then the business in the garage became so much that he he quit boston cadillac and did a full-time full-time uh, repair at the garage okay and and then that became popular and they bought a gas station on route one mm -hmm. now route one in in the united states goes from maine to florida right and it's there's also one a so one a is a small road one being the medium road 95 being the major highway so he he built a building in 1938 a gas station and it just kind of went from there so he ended up. Um, how many how many dealerships did he own? Was it dealerships that he got into? Well, what did happened? He buy into those. What happened was is is he had a gas station, gas right. and repair. Right. And yeah, I might get the years wrong, but we get yeah, we yeah, get, we you know somewhere somewhere in the late forties, early fifties. Uh, the bookkeeper stole ten thousand dollars from my grandfather. Jeez. Yes, and and That's back then ten thousand dollars was a lot of money, and he went everywhere trying to get the money. Nobody would give him the money. Right. And uh, my father used to used to pump gas, mm. and you know th th this is going to sound like a made up story, but this is a real story. My father was uh, pumping gas. They were ready to close at the end of the month, didn't have the dough. Right. And some guy pulled up and said, why do you look so glum? And and my father said, well, we get stolen. This is the banks won't give me money. And and the gentleman right there said, why don't you come see me tomorrow? And it was Dominic Sansone from New England Merchant Bank, vice president at New England Merchant Bank. My father went in and he gave him the money. Wow. And, and, and my father and, and Dominic were best friends till Dominic died. You know, went, Interesting. Went before, yeah, went before my father. Okay. And uh, that's, what, that's really what, what took off. And then again... While my father was pumping gas, a gentleman pulled up and said, hey, this place looks good. Uh, how'd you like to sell Nash's? Mm, you know, okay. Nash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nash. Yeah, right. so people nowadays might not know what a Nash right. is. Right, Nash, yeah. Nash, Rambler, American Motors, yeah. Chrysler. Yeah. You know, they technically, they own Ferrari. Right, you know? right. So, so the, the gentleman said, you can, you know, you'll probably, you'll probably sell 10 cars a year. And, and my father did it. He, he worked with, with uh, my grandfather. And my father's brother was in the back of the house. Okay. My, my father was in the front of the house. And by the mid to late 50s, we were the number one Nash dealer in the country, 5000 a year. Wow. Yeah, 5000 a year. So from that, from Nash, it went to, I think we went Nash, um, American Motors, and then Dodge, mm. and then we got Oldsmobile, Toyota. In 1971, we picked up Toyota, 
Oldsmobile and the distribution for Subaru through the six states of New England with a perpetual contract from the Japanese. Interesting. Yeah. So you guys got a piece of every Subaru in New England? Right. Okay. What happened was Dominic called him up mm. and said, hey, Ernie, there's a gentleman that's importing Sabo. You know, could, could barely pronounce the name right. back then. And, and he wants money. And, and I don't know. Anything. Will you look at it and see? Okay. And, and the guy wanted $25,000. And my father said, said, I like it. I'll, I'll go into business with the guy. Mm. So he went into business with this gentleman. And... Uh, started started visiting dealers throughout New England and soon found that this gentleman went to Saab dealers for some reason and had them uh, uh, duel with Subaru. Okay. And he went into the dealerships and the Subarus way in back, like way in back, you know, b- barely even selling them. Mm. And that's when we decided and implemented uh, no duels, single point dealers. And right. to this day, New England is the only region in the world where it's all single point dealers. Subaru, even Japan doesn't have single point. And the country is about right now, they've been doing it for 20 years. They're about 80% non-dueled. Wow. But still they have duels. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So I read, uh, I've been reading reading about you online a little bit, what I can find here and there. And I, I, there was this article saying that, um, well, I guess let me back that up a little bit. So you went to, was it high school or college for music? I went to Berkeley College of Music for, high, for college, yeah. Right, right. And after that, what was the goal there? Did you, it, it, this article anyway, stated that you kind of wanted to, you joined a band and you were on, the, on tour? Well, well. <laughs> is that, is that? Here's how it is, okay. I mean, I graduated high school in 1976, okay? okay. The 70s were you know, if you didn't grow up in the seventies, they were crazy. When right. I, when I, when I graduated interest rate prime was 21%, yeah. 21%. And you know, Woodstock just happened, you know, I was a kid and everything. And you know, I, I used to play guitar and mm-hmm. I, and you know, that actually Woodstock changed my life. It really did. It really, you know, I, I, I had never seen that much gathering of, of, you know, I was too young to be a hippie. Would I was right. ten when Woodstock happened? You didn't, you didn't go to Woodstock. No, no, but no, just no. The, Being in that no, area, no, just, just, just seeing it on TV sure. and reading Crawdad and Rolling Stone and everything like that. I just, I thought it was amazing, and I really. And then the record came out, and I listened to it nonstop. And, yeah. And then you know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to play. You know, I had been in bands in high school and stuff. Never really any good bands. And when it was time to go to college, I, gra- I, I applied for one school, and it was Berkeley, and they, they took me. Okay. Which, you know, I was shocked. Right. And almost the second I got there, I said, holy shit. I mean, these are some of the best players in the world. To this day, in the world, they, they, they take less than 30% of the people that apply right now. Right. But back in the 70s, they were taking anybody, okay. which was me. <laughs> so I went there, quickly learned that uh, that's a, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. So I, I, gave it a, I gave it a go. I actually toured Canada in some disco band. Really? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, it just wasn't going well. And um, it just wasn't going well. And I got into debt. Oh, okay. okay. I got into debt and it was, and I hate debt to this day. I have no debt. Right. Hate, hate, hate debt. Yep. And I went to my father and I said, listen, you know, and this, this is probably, mm, I don't know, mm, almost 1980. You okay. Know, almost How old are you at the time? Like after, it's well, after college? Yeah. Yeah. I was, t- I was 20 and 78. So. So, you know, it's yeah, 22, 23, something it. like that. And, yep. you know, I was playing on the streets of Boston. We were making 40 to 60 bucks a day thinking, you know, that was a lot of money. Yeah. So I went to him and I said, listen, it's, it's not going well. I, I owed, the, I owed uh, AT&T before they broke up. Ah. AD, before they, 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 they broke up, uh, I owed them money and this and that. And I, and I went to him and I said, listen. I, I'm in debt, and uh, I'd like to I'd like to get a job until I get out of debt. And you know, will you give me a job? And he said, "Well, how much do you owe?" Mm. And at the time, to me, it was all the money in, in the world. I owed six hundred dollars. Right. I owed six hundred dollars, and he said, "All right, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. I'll give you money to buy a suit, and then 
in your, you know, while you're selling cars, you can pay me back. Okay. Well, I mean, I went from making $150 a week to $1,500 a week in a week. Wow. I just like a fish to water. It was just amazing. As a, as a salesman. Yeah, as a salesman. Right. And it was exciting. I mean, I made every mistake in the world, but what I did do is I was there bell to bell. Mm. I just, you know, I have somewhat of a, you know, I look like I do drugs, but I don't do drugs anymore, but I have an addictive tendency you know what right. I mean? like when i was playing guitar it was all in when i was selling cars it was all in so i really it really kind of started from there and then you know and that's i joined the company and well put a tie on because i used to work when i used to get suspended from school uh. he would make me work at the dealership so it was the punishment yeah as okay. the punishment he would make me work at the dealership and what, what were you getting suspended from school for uh, it was the 70s <laughs> it was the 70s you know you, 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 People forget that, that that in the 70s, you could, you could, you, you, there was Panama red. I mean, it was red. There was uh, Jamaican dirt weed. It was like brown. There was Sensamia, which was like bright green. There was Acapulco gold. It was literally gold. I mean, pot was amazing back then, you know? So, so, so smoking weed in high school. Smoking weed in high school, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sex, drugs, and rock and yeah. roll. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So- now you're working. You're working full time at the dealership, and you're doing well. Well, when you're not high school, but yeah. Afterwards. What yeah. happened was is I I started selling cars in the in the eighties, and then then right in the late eighties, um, early nineties, my father said, uh, "Will you run the Oldsmobile store?" Hmm. And you know, I didn't really, you know, running the Oldsmobile store did not excite. Running any store didn't excite me because I got there. I didn't have to. I didn't have to open up i didn't have to close i just went there made money uh, um dated customers you know what i mean <laughs> i mean i was like in a, my own little uh, whatever fiefdom yep and i didn't really want to i didn't really want to be a manager all the managers were miserable getting yelled at at meetings and stuff i have no way was i going to do that and he just kind of started tossing money at me saying will you do it for this will you do it for this and then he got me he right. got me and i and i went to uh, ozenbiel i went all i think I went all the way up to 96, I think was the last year of Oldsmobile, 1996. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then, then from there, I, I ran the um, Mitsubishi store. Right. We had Mitsubishi, and then I got fired. I got fired from Mitsubishi. Oh, by who? By the old man. I got okay. fired by the old man. I probably deserved getting what fired. What happened there? Oh, just... just, you know, I mean, I wasn't, you know, I didn't really... I wasn't trained. Everything I learned was, was, you know, and it wasn't like he took me under his wing. He basically just threw me on the floor and the managers beat the crap out of me and, and taught me. Right. And uh, I got fired from there and then I went to Toyota. Okay. I went to Toyota and killed it. Absolutely killed it. Selling mm -hmm. just tremendous. I back, back to a salesperson having, again, the time of my life. Right. And um, then I was a manager at Toyota and, and you know, and, and this and that. And then we, we had Toyota and then we, Mitsubishi. Then we picked up Kia and then we picked up Honda and <clears throat> my father died in 03. Okay. My father died in 03 and, and I had never really been exposed to the dis distributorship. Just, right. You know, I'd been to Japan as just looking and stuff like that. So I, I jumped in at 03 and um, ran the, the uh, Subaru distributorship and the retail stores. I brought the Honda store to the number one Honda store in the world. Wow. The world. Nobody beat me. Nobody wow. beat me. I've, you know, all those California guys and Texas guys and Florida guys that don't get snow. In New England, sales can change 40 percent in a in a month because of snow and everything like that yeah so it did that and i got to toyota to number two the only one that beat me was longo out in california and then i bought a second toyota store i bought a second honda store and um and then then i got ferrari maserati mm -hmm. in 05 or 06 and and then, then retail, I just woke up one day and I just didn't want to do retail. So I sold the retail stores. All the I, dealerships. Uh, all, so all the body shop, rental, the dealerships, right. uh, everything. I sold except for Ferrari and Maserati because right. I just love the cars. And if, you, if you're if you a Ferrari dealer and you sell Ferrari, you'll never get another store. You'll right. never get another store. 
So I kept that. I, so I have the distributorship and Ferrari Maserati. So I went from 1,800 employees to 138. Wow. You know? How many dealerships was it that you sold? Uh, two Toyota, two Honda, um, uh, a big used car, mm. big used car store, rental, body shop. Sure. Yeah, because okay. I had sold, well, I, d during the course, I had sold Maserati. I, I mean, I had sold Mitsubishi and I had sold Kia. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So now you've you've taken a big paycheck to do that and you're you're kind of fed up with the retail stuff or you wanted to look well, at others. Well, it's just others. tough. Retail is just so tough. Right. And, and Maserati and Ferrari isn't really retail. It's kind of it's kind of like this place. It's rolling art. You right. know, that's what it is. Right. And and very different di very different clientele. You're not very getting sold different, out for 500 bucks down the street. Very different yeah. clientele. The 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 tough thing about the the high-end clientele which you can probably relate to is these guys, most of these guys are self-made millionaires running Running their own show don't like no for an answer right do not like no yeah so they would come in and they'd want a ferrari and i'm you know i i, I couldn't get them the ferrari so you know i'm i've worked that out to the point where i where the store is very well respected and you know we're doing great things so these guys come in and they are a little bit on the defense instead of the offense right now. yeah right right so does that give you more free time to look outside running the dealerships at that time when you oh, sell absolutely everything? absolutely and yeah did you have a, a vision of what you wanted to do with your time well i have a foundation called yep. music drives us which right. we try to keep music in the schools mm -hmm. and i do i we do um, various events to raise money, and then of course we fund all sorts of projects. Right, and then then I do. You know, I I consider myself a philanthropist. I, you oh, know, absolutely! I'm involved yeah. in a lot of different things. So let's go back to the the music drives. That is music a, drives us. Yeah, yeah, it drives us. Yeah, it's a, that's a massive program. It's it's well a five hundred one c three in the six states of New England. Right, I, uh, you know you have to get a you have to get a five hundred one three certificate for every state you're in. So in the so for the six Six states of New England, I have a 501c3. Right. And that is, you know, there's a there's a million ways you can go with charity and philanthropy. Absolutely. And uh, why, why the music? Is it because it was so big in your life? Yeah, because it's so big in my life. And, you know, I, I really, you know, I'm very, very happy. Like, for example, the, the Subaru commercials that are on in New England, I play guitar on them cool you know and we record them at we record them at my house you know with today look, look at us we're in you know i don't want to say a back room but you know we're not in some big giant studio yeah and and you can easily do that so my friend and my friend writes them i might change a chord here or there sure but do we do that we record them and then uh so i've integrated i've integrated my love for music into the business and then with music drives us i mean i had cheap trick playing at my house in november to raise money for music drives us cool so not only did we raise money but you know cheap trick yeah yeah you know? absolutely <laughs> yeah so specifically are you guys uh buying a lot of instruments and and giving yes. them to schools oh absolutely right okay. before the pandemic we did that we gave 750 ukuleles to the boston school um system whatever they call right. it and i don't know what it's like in canada but in the united states around second or third grade you 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 had to take the recorder uh, did you guys have yes, to do that yes, yes. okay we had to dip it in mouthwash yeah, yeah. okay all right <laughs> well that's changing because now instead of the recorder they're doing the uke okay so because it came from, you know, when the family is together, oh, Johnny's taking music and he pulls out the recorder and people run, uh, you know, but now he pulls out the ukulele and it's like, woo, this is cool. Right. Yeah. Okay. I got yeah. it. I got it. So, yeah, I mean, you're, you're clearly a super generous guy uh, and really a philanthropist. You know, you see, I'm, again, looking up articles online and you see Ernie Bach Jr. gives massive tip at this restaurant, yeah. massive tip at this restaurant. What, what guides you in your philanthropy? I, I just see a need. And, and speaking of that, this, I'm not saying everything isn't true okay. on the online, internet, but yeah. if you really want to get an idea of, you know, what I'm like that isn't you know, because I take a lot of shit for a lot of things. If you if you Google Ernie Bach Jr. slash Uganda. Yes, I've got that in my notes. Uganda, Don't worry, we're going to go to it. That is good. That yeah. kind of sums me up a lot better than, 
you know, Wikipedia. Sure. And I, so I watched that episode uh, the other day. That you got, the Nat Geo show? Yeah. Yeah. I, t- tell me about that. How did that come <sighs> to fruition? How did that come about? Well, I was at, I was at my office and uh, I got a call. My, my, my assistant got a call and said, there's some TV producer on the phone wants to talk to you. I go, all right, I'll, I'll call him. And uh, they said, uh, Ernie, we're, um, we're doing a TV show for Nat Geo and we're going around the country and we're looking for, how can we describe this? Successful people that are a little off. And I go, <laughs> that, you, you got the guy. I'm the guy. I'm the guy. And they said, you know, after talking to them, they said, Ernie, we've been to New York. We've been to L.A. We've been to this. We've been to that. But this is the only city we went to when we asked who we should talk to. Everybody said you. Right. So one thing led to another between all these meetings and everything. I did a show for Nat Geo. And it was called Undercover Angel. Undercover, kind of like Undercover Boss, except a more international thing. Right. They took, I think it was 12 people. I didn't, I didn't, my show was only an hour. Right. You know, but they, so they, so that what they did is they, they, they dropped you someplace in the world and with with no resources under a fake name and you had to make a difference the greatest guy that ever did that are you familiar with grant cardone uh yes okay they did this yes I know grant they, they dropped grant cardone in pueblo california and in like two days he built a multi-million dollar business i mean it's like the greatest show oh i gotta Plus see he's, that one. he's the greatest guy right with me it was different it was 10 days okay it was 10 days and i you know i i very quickly learned that uganda has a water problem problem just like like a lot of places in africa well hey, let me let me back you up there because they they dump you in a remote village oh yeah and you're staying in, oh, yeah. in you're not staying in a five-star hotel so I, I was, but it, this wasn't even <laughs> this you could, there were no stars i mean it was a it was it was literally in in um in Wajinja, Uganda, I was literally the only white guy. My my yeah. crew was English, so you know they they were they were white also. But I was the only white guy. No paved roads, no running water, no electricity. Um, you know, you figure, oh, Africa, you kill a few animals. Those animals were gone in like the late eighteen hundreds. You know, no animals. The only protein there are, are chickens, rabbits, goats, cows, but they're privately owned. So it's right. you know, it's very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, it was it was intense. You know, and the whole time, the whole time I said to him, I said, Listen, I don't care where you drop me. I don't care as long as I have a a, a, a clean bathroom and a nice bed, drop me anywhere. No bed, no bathroom. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was, it was, it was. Yeah, you were roughing it. Yeah, it was tough. So that, and I, it's fresh in my mind because I just watched it. So the first day, they're like, I think you said in the show, they're walking 17 hours a week to collect water. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And plus, when they, when we, we get into Kampala, which, you know, I mean, the bullet holes for when Idi Amin was running the place is still all over this, all over the city. When they they brought me, and then we went like three hours into the the, the it's not the jungle, it's like the bush, but it's right. not the bush like like it's not the bush like it's Australia. Not thick, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's a weird thing, and they these people that I w- was with for like five days because because they were over my house filming because they had to introduce me to a, an international audience. Nobody knows who I am. So they had to kind of give a background and everything like that. And, and I was with them. I was friendly with them. We get there and they just walk away. Like, like almost like a, like a mama bird pushes the baby bird out of the nest. Right. They just walked away. And I was, and I was like, Hey, what are you doing? They go, you know, I don't know if are we filming this. Can you see? They're like not even looking at me. They're just filming, and I'm talking to them. They're not answering. Uh, you know, it was. Um, they're just leaving it to you. They're just leaving it to me. Yeah. Uh huh. So you really like there was no director in that show. Is really a lot. Dri- well, there was, dri- but everything you. you see in that show is real. You're right. That is re- and, the, and and half the stuff they didn't even. It's only an hour. Half yeah. the stuff they didn't even put in. Right. Right. Yeah. So regardless, or anyways, you, you're you're there, and you re, it becomes evident that that the issue in this small little village is is clean water. Well, and the, the issue in a lot of Africa is water, and what's unbelievable is they have plenty of water. It's four feet under the ground. They don't have the dough to to 
dig for it. Right. So I, I kind of adopted this village and I put in water. I put in a school. I put in all sorts of things. Um, I just opened up Bach Medical. I, okay. we, I opened a hospital. What? Uh, where? In Uganda. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Wajinja. Awesome. Yeah. In oh, that little yeah, you can okay. go to you can go to uh, BachMedicalCenter.org and, and, and awesome. look at it. And then and I just had the queen of uh, Uganda over my house. No way. Yeah, yeah. She was over uh, three weeks ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so I you, really like it. I like yeah. the country. I like the village. Now we're now we're working on my guy, my on the ground guy, Derek. Okay. We're going to do uh, we're going to do an agricultural thing. We're looking for tracts of land, and and they're gonna they're gonna grow their own stuff because now that we have the water, right? You know, and it's funny over there. And listen, nothing against the Ugandan men. I like the Ugandan men, but they don't work. It's mm. all the women. The women are the responsible ones. Really? Yeah. Why yeah. do you think that is? It's just the culture. What, and what, like that, I'm sure it wasn't the culture for all of time. What, what changed? What I think it was the culture for all of time. Really? Yeah. Okay. I, I, you know, I, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just observing, giving sure. my personal opinion. Please don't no, email no. you yeah, yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah. but you know, it's, you know, it's, you, 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 I mean, you go around the village and stuff, it's all guys hanging around. The women are home doing all the work. Interesting. So can people, um, do you have a fund or can people donate to help you on these projects? Yeah, you can go to, you can go to, I mean, I'm on social, Ernie Bach Jr. Yep. on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, you know. Yeah, yeah, so they'll find you, okay. Yeah, 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 if you, yeah. So at the end of the show, you had built this killer water tower. Yeah. And everyone, there was yeah. 35 water taps, yep. I remember. Yep. Spigots, yeah. Spigots, yep. okay. Yep. Yep. But, the, but the mayor didn't have one close to his house. And that was real. The, right. ma the mayor didn't have one close to the house, but what he did have is he had this giant tank of water in his backyard. Oh, he had this giant, I didn't see that. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, some things they didn't show. <laughs> he had this giant thing. So he's so when he brings me to his house, like like they prepped me like as I'm walking through the door that the guy's upset. Oh, like, geez. you know, like as I'm walking through the door. So he's telling me he's running the place that I, who am I to say where the spigots are? He's the chief elder or something and i'm like listen uh, you know i i didn't pick where the spigots went i left it up to you know the, the, the derek and the in the, the people yeah but we got out of it he's a nice guy okay good i mean it seems just absurd to be upset about with this guy who just gave your whole village fresh water hey you give an inch <laughs> yep yeah absolutely so seeing that um you know i guess being in that philanthropy philanthropy space and seeing that um you know that problem in africa and in uganda do you do anything uh more i guess for poverty in the u.s or do, yeah, you, see, well, do you see poverty uh, you know i i because, it, because i try it, to give back in my own backyard right you because, know i've done a lot of projects but i mean so i guess my question was seeing the absolute prov poverty in uganda and then seeing the u.s there's so many resources in the U.S. Yes. It seems more like there must be barriers instead of having to do good. It, it must be, in my mind, it seems like it's more like removing barriers in the U.S. because there's so much wealth, you know, inches away. Right, right, right. But the Ugandan poverty is different. I, you know, I've, I haven't been everywhere in the world, but I've been to a lot of places. And each country has their own vibe, like the, the, in India, you know, Calcutta. Hmm. I mean, Calcutta makes Uganda look like New York City. Really? You know, I mean, it's, yeah, this, it's this crazy, intense insanity around the world. And I'm just a little guy trying to do my best to help. Right. Wow. So uh, have you done all this? You've been to a, a bunch of places all over the world. And is that just for pleasure? Is that? Yeah, for pleasure. I okay. mean, I, you know, when I'm, when I travel, I try to be generous and, you know, do it. But Uganda was specific. For that show. You know, yeah. Well, yeah. I didn't know. I had no idea about the water. Right. You know, when, when, <laughs> when I wanted water and they pointed to the, to the jerry cans and they said, you know, four miles that way. And I get there and it's completely completely contaminated and mm. and shit all over the place and dead animals floating i said whoa yeah yeah, yeah. No, 400 I... ugandans a day die of bad water 400 a day wow huh and uh, like are there uh, there must be other programs like your program trying to bring oh yeah water. yeah well i i i 
somehow through whatever, I, there's a there's a company called Drop for Drop. Okay. And they are the people I I use to help me navigate. You know, once I got my f- feet wet, you mm-hmm. know. And it's funny because. I did um, when the show was all over and everything. I went to uh, I went to London to do promo, mm. and they said to me, they said, "Hey, the guy that owns Drop for Drop wants to wants to um, have uh, wants to meet you at the pub." Okay, and I go, "Oh, cool. Okay, excellent." So I get there, and it's like this really big burly guy and everything like that, and we're talking and we're drinking that English beer, like you know, I mean two of those things and you three sheets to the wind <laughs> and and we were talking and everything he goes hey i'm gonna be in boston i go oh cool she, she he says um he says my wife is playing there and i go oh your wife is playing there good what venue she, and he says he says boston garden i go i go okay your wife is playing boston who the hell is your wife adele his wife is wow. Adele. So I think they're divorced now. But anyway, yeah, he, he, Simon <laughs> is the guy that started Drop for Drop. Really cool guy. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. So um, I guess going back to uh, something else that shows up on your Wikipedia page, you were a big Trump supporter in 2016. Well, well okay, okay. Or you're I'm a prominent. Not, I'm, not, look, I'm not defending. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and coil back. But let me tell you something. When I was a kid in the 80s, Trump was the man. Oh, 100%. He was the yeah. man. Yeah. I mean, he was unbelievable. A little sideways here and there, but it was the 80s. Yep. And then and then he said he was going to run for president. And, you know, people thought it was a joke. They right. thought it was a joke. But I'm a Republican. Yep. I believe in less government and lower taxes. Sure. Okay. Um, with all due respect... The gentleman. First of all, any president is my president. Mm. I don't sit there and go, he's not my. But anybody that's in the White House, he's my president. Got Do it. I agree with them? No, and I don't have to. Yep. But I'm not going to sit there and protest and everything like that. I'm going to go through the system. So, so I, I, you know, he said he was going to run for president. I'm like, oh wow, Trump president. That could be interesting. Business guy, you know, you know. Sure. And 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 I was. Um, I get a lot of my 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 because i'm out a lot i get a lot of my 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 news on my phone sure so I, you know i was watching the phone and seeing all this stuff about trump and then i go home and i'm having dinner turn on the tv it's trump right i change the channel it's trump right. i change the channel again it's trump i'm channel after channel after channel it's trump i go wow this guy this this might be it now in massachusetts we're like i don't know 90 percent democratic a republic they um uh, uh, uh reagan one in Massachusetts in 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 eighty four. Okay, like the only time a, a a Republican won Massachusetts. So I said to myself, all the Republican candidates, Massachusetts is a flyover. Right. It's it's they're not going to win. They don't go there. So I said, well, maybe I could get a small group of my friends hmm. together, invite Trump over, and and suss him out, see what he's see what he's doing, see you know see sure. what's up. So I said, how the hell am I going to get a hold of Trump? Right. So I called, I called my friend um, Howie Carr that has a radio show. Yep. And I said, Howie, I'm thinking of having Trump over my house just to kind of check it out, see if he's real. And he goes, here, call this guy. So one ring, I call up, and, I, and, and the guy says, hello. And I go, I go um, hi, you know, my name's Ernie Bach, and I get this number from Howie. And he said that, that maybe you could connect me to Trump because I'm in, a, I'm in a Democratic state. Maybe he'll come by, talk to some people. And he says to me, hey, Ernie, how you doing? I go, I go are you from around here? Yeah. He goes, yeah, I live in New Hampshire. I go, ah! I go, Corey, this is great because then— then you know I didn't have to answer any questions. It was right, just, it was just easy. Yeah. So one thing led to another, and 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 I started planning this little thing, and then then I figured, well, I'll charge. I'll have ten people over my house. I'll charge them a couple hundred bucks, and mm. you know, do a little bit of a fundraiser. One thing led to another, and no one has had done a fundraiser for Trump. Oh. So so Corey tells him that I'm thinking of doing a fundraiser. So he calls me to his office in New York and and then I announced that you know I'm doing the first fundraiser and then Fox CNN boom 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 everybody in the world wants to come at 1200 people over my house 
helicopters, CNN broadcasting from my backyard, <laughs> 102 press credentials in my front yard. Now, you know, I know how to throw a bash. So with the press credentials, I gave them all the good food and gave them their own bar. Right. I still talk to some of those people because we had such a, we had such good. a good time. So one thing led to another. He came over and then, and you know, it was very successful. Sure. Uh, but I got a lot of crap from it, you know, a lot of crap because, you know, as it went, everybody hates him and, you know, whatever. He did win. This is, and this is early on. This, this is, is August of 15. Right. This is August. You didn't of realize how much a, people hated it. It's him. a funny story because, it, because, um, when we did it, we did it. We, we, we did the fundraiser, and the next day I went to Uganda. Oh. So it's almost like I, I, I lit a match, threw it over my, my shoulder, and the <laughs> bridge burnt. Yeah. You know, because I had no idea on the backlash. <laughs> I'm in the, you know, I'm in a, a hut in Uganda not knowing that <sighs> right. it's going crazy. But I got through it. And, yep. and you know, like I said, I'm a, I'm a, I consider myself a Reagan Republican. Sure. Small government, mm -hmm. small government, and and I to tell you the truth, I don't care what the Democrats, any social programs, because I'm socially liberal and fiscally conservative. So if they want, most people are. If they want a, any program they want, pay for it. Yep, that's my issue. Right. Pay for it. Just pay for it. I'll anything you want. Pay for it. I'll pay more taxes if if I know it's you know going to something. Right. But anyway, so yeah, so that. So you're you're a. Uh like a lifelong Republican, but I don't, you know, I'm, I'm just putting myself in your shoes. You don't, you invite Trump over, you get to have a conversation with him. Oh my God. What did, what did you learn from that? <laughs> this is what I learned from that. Okay. Um, a New York real estate guy mm -hmm. from Manhattan became president. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to any of the, if you go to any of the steak houses in Manhattan, there's a million Trumps there. They're all, they're, they're all at the bar. Right. You know, he is, he's, he's a real estate guy from Manhattan. They're all like that. And all of a sudden the country's like, oh, we've never seen anything like, well, just go to, go to Manhattan. You'll see a ton of them. Right. Do you think it was because he was outside of the whole oh, he, apparatus? Jeb the whole Bush system? was supposed to be president. Right. He blew up that whole system. The holes, he caught them sleeping mm. and he won. Right. He won and he, and, and he just... He, <sighs> is that why he was so demonized because he was yeah, uncontrollable? Yeah, he was uncontrollable, and and they it was their party, and right. he threw him out, made it his party. Right? Did you catch? So you come back from Uganda, oh. and the the bridge is burning. Oh, the bridge is burning. <laughs> Did you get a bunch of flack from? Flack? I get death threats. Really? Oh my God! I'll never do business with you. You? I still get them. If if I do anything, if I do, I did a I did a thing. Um, I did a thing. Um. April Fuels Day, right? Where I gave away seven thousand gallons of gas when gas was rising up and everything like that. And you know, I mean, I thought it was a good gesture trying to help people out. And it's funny if you see anything right now on social, and I do something, it's like, oh, Ernie, that was great. We love it. Bye, 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 bye. But then pretty soon, you suck. Trump sucks, <laughs> and it just goes all downhill. Right. Right. The April Fools, fuels. April fuels. So it was like all over the news, right? Yeah, so yeah. you gave away free fuel all day. Seven thousand gallons of gas. Wow. Yeah. How big? Like how big a mess was that? How well, big was the lineup? I told the you know I told the police we did it was fine, but but listen to this, ready? Thanksgiving. That's what you're doing next. Thanksgiving. Think Fu about free that. fuel. Oh, think about that. Thanksgiving. You're gonna have tankers. No. Tank, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Thanksgiving. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Do you have any other big, um, big plans philanthropically? Uh, well, I bought an island. I bought. Oh. A, I bought an island um, recently. I just bought it. Where it, is it? It's um, off the coast of Massachusetts. Okay. Like not like off the coast. Like. 350 feet off the coast. Okay it's, got, okay. it's got a bridge and everything. So, so I'm going to come up with something cool. For How that. big is it? Uh, 4.25 acres. Okay. And, and don't you, do you guys talk hectares here? No, no, we talk acres. Okay. We talk acres. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kilometers. We, we still, yeah. miles, we still get yeah, it. Yeah, because uh, the nav girl was talking kilometers on the way here. Right. And, and I was asking the driver, uh, what the temperature was, and he goes, "Oh, tomorrow will be in the twenties." You know, like we, yeah. that's not. What do you what, mean? <laughs> yeah, we don't. We don't do that. I didn't pack my winter jacket. Yeah. Right. So I, I think I was telling you before. So 
looking looking at at uh, Ernie Bach commercials. Ugh. These are awesome, Mitch. Mitch, do you have one? Can you pull one up? No, no, no. Here you go. A little disclaimer. Okay. I mean, you know, I mean that was that. It, 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 they worked. I mean, you know, and I, you know, I have a good business, but it's kind of like when you look back at your high school picture. Well, I'm talking the I'm talking the vintage ones. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah, talking okay, about. Okay. Like when you look back at the your, your high school picture and you go, "What the hell was I thinking?" You know what's funny about me is like I'll look at a picture that I took yesterday and go, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> you know? Oh, we all change. These, like... Oh, what are you going to... Pl- oh, no, that's my father. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That's my about. father. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Were these, er- like, early... 64. Ad- See, the thing about it is my father... My father was kind of a, 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 a folk hero in New England because he was one of the first guys on TV to promote his own business. This is 1964. Yeah. There were only, like... Three channels. And right. if you were on, the mere fact that you were on TV was amazing. And he did a hell of a job. So he was an early adopter of television commercials. He was an early adopter of uh, owning and promoting your business. Interesting. Yes. So do you th- do you attribute a lot of his success to that? Absolutely. I mean, he, he, took a, he took a business from nothing and made it a multi-million dollar business. So that's like getting on Google early. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And this particular one, see, if you're not from around here, you don't get it. When this came out in 1966, you had kids taking hammers from their father's tool and smashing door, door windows, other windows. Because yeah, Ernie, because Ernie this, Sr. Yeah. did it. Yeah. <laughs> no way. Because this had to have, like, I'm watching this, right? And I'm, one, I'm thinking, okay, this is a very early car commercial. Right, yeah. And two, this is like the blueprint for all the crazy car commercials that came right. after. But if you look at it, if play it again, if you look at it, he's challenging other dealers with a hammer in his hand. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. So now, so he was an early adopter of this, and he did these commercials, and it looks like they were a lot of fun. Yeah. You do uh, some TV stuff. Well, well. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> My father would, my father, you know, let me tell you, I learned everything I know about business from my father. Great man, you know, wish he was still here. I miss him every day. Right. But, That's but, good, Mitch, thanks. Yeah, but, but the thing is, is that, that he would make a commercial and run it for like five years. Right. You know what I mean? Just yeah. run it for five years. So, you know, you'd be looking at the cars go, wait a second, that car's five years old. <laughs> this thing. So when I took over, I, I, at first when I took over, I was doing a commercial in the showroom every month. Really? Every month. It was, uh, I don't even know how I, I don't even know how I did it. Now it's all, um, it's all um, uh, graphics and voiceovers. Right. Factory running footage, which I don't pay for. Right. The graphics and then voiceover. Right. Right. So, um, so you do all those commercials, you do, uh, you do a cartoon. Well, I have these, I have these, well, I'm friends with this gentleman that, that has a company in Boston called Fable Vision. Okay. And he's kind of a, he's, his big book was The Dot. As a matter of fact, he's illustrating and working with Cat Stevens for his new album cover. I don't know if you're a Cat Stevens fan. No, not really. No, see, I love that stuff. I, that was the first show I ever went to. Okay. But anyway, so I'm working with Peter Reynolds and I do these little 15 and 30, they're not commercials. They're, they're kind of. Um, see, I have kids. Mm-hmm. They're kind of, and, and I believe in PBS, mm. you know, public, yep, s- yep. Uh, public uh, service television. And, um, and I wanted to go on PBS, but I didn't want to be just like, you know, this is brought to you by blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's pretty dry. PBS is pretty dry. It although, is, yeah. Although I do love Nova and Masterpiece Theater okay. and, um, and uh, that antique show. But anyway. So I wanted to do something a little different. I wanted to I wanted to go on PBS. I wanted to talk to the kids, and I wanted to I wanted to um, use the resources that my friend had with animation. Right. So I first started the ki- the kids were live in an animated world, mm. and then that's you know you know the old never work with animals or kids you know <laughs> it was a nightmare they're crying and everything and so so i said the hell with that so i so i just animated everybody and now my kids are my kids are you know 20 but in the cartoons they're like 10 and 11 and they will stay that way look at bart simpsons he's 35 right right that's cool that's cool hmm so uh 
I've seen a video of the, uh, I guess it's the architect put it out of your house and the interior of your house. And it's a cool deal, like done up. It, it, they were showing it like it was all like, like looks like India. Oh, that's, that's, that's my lounge. That's your lounge. That's my lounge. So it's not your whole house. No, no. I, oh. I have, um, I bought a house. I bought a, um, I bought a, I've had two houses my whole life. I bought my first house in 1987. Okay. And then 10 years later, I moved to my current house. I moved to my current house, um, April 1st, 1997. Okay. And you go, Ernie, how do you remember that day? Well, around my neck of the woods, we, that was what they called and is still referred to today as the April Fool's snowstorm. April 1st, 1997, we got three feet of snow. Holy Three cow. feet of snow in one dumping. And that's the day I moved into my house. <laughs> so I moved into the house and the house was, uh, it's the last privately owned Endicott house. Around my area, we had the Endicott family. They had Endicott Johnson shoes. They work with Bird as one of the first developers of... Uh, of uh, shingles, uh, mm. what do you call the the stuff on the road with the shingles? What do they call it? asphalt? Asphalt, asphalt, asphalt yeah, yeah. Sh- shingles. Yep. So a very prominent business guy, and and it was the house was built in twenty eight, and it was on five hundred acres, spanned three towns, and it was Endicott Farms. They had apples, they had cows. I mean, I, every time I dig up anything, I find I find milk bottles with Endicott Farms on it and everything. And um, when I moved in, it was um, less than two acres. So I bought the 17 houses that surround my house, and now it's 7.9 acres. So I have a nice little, I didn't bring it back to its original glory, sure. but, I, but I did. So the seven structures on, and that, the one you're talking about is, is the, uh, I call it the lounge. Okay. And that first, that came, the first house of blues, do you know the house of blues? Sure. The house of blues, the first house of blues was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. And I think the second one was in L.A. And we, we didn't have a foundation room like they have now. And I went to, I think I went to, I think Aerosmith opened up the House of Blues. And I went there and I saw the foundation room at the House of Blues in L.A. And it just floored me. So I had a space in one of my garages. And I tracked down that guy that, that did it. And I sent him to India for three weeks to buy all this crazy stuff he took a picture of his head you want this you want that i got a big pile of the stuff here and then we put it all together and that's the room we came up with cool yeah cool so i don't know if you took a hiatus from music at all when you were kind of you know really up to your elbows in in the dealership i I didn't play for years right for years but now you're in a band well what happened was is i was i was i call it hitting it hard you know, I had really short hair, wearing suits for 14 hours. Yeah. And I was, I was, uh, again, at, at work, and my, my, my assistant said, hey, somebody, some, the news is on the phone, they want you to do something. And they were, they, they had an opportunity, they were taking kind of well-known people around Boston that they thought had musical talent and play with the Boston Pops. Okay. A night of the Boston Pops. So they called me up and they said, do you want to play with the Pops? And the and first thing out of my mouth was yes. I hadn't played for 10 years. Right. And I said yes. And, and, you know, and then I hung up and I go, oh, shit, I got to play with the <laughs> Pops. So wouldn't you know, my very good friend John Finn is the guitar player for the Pops. Okay. So he kind of helped me out and helped me through it. And, right. and uh, Keith Lockhart, you know, he's, uh, he runs Pops. Now, okay. I know Keith, so I'm not talking out of school. He's tough. You know, those conductors, they're tough. Right. They're tough. I mean, they're tough. So I was, I was just his reputation, I was afraid. And, and then, they, you know, we went to Symphony Hall to rehearse, and people would get up, and they'd get one time through the song whether they effed it up or whatever, one time through uh. the song. So I'm seeing all these people crash and burn, and I'm going, oh, crap. So I get up there, and I, you know, I think I barely made it through. And then, you know, the next day was the performance, and I played with the Boston Pops at Symphony Hall. That kind of got me going again, and then mm. I started playing again. Right. So you're, you've got a band now. No, I used to have a band. You used to have a band. I used to have a band. Okay. And it was Ernie and the Automatics. Yes, begrudgingly. Begrudgingly, it was Ernie and the Automatics. Okay. Yeah. And you're playing with some some guys who played in the band Boston. Yeah. Am I correct in that? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. How yeah. did that all come about? Uh, well, what happened was is is I, I play with the pop, so I stop playing. I get the you know I get the fire again. I'm I'm playing. Yeah. I, I have a friend Jeff Myro 
if Jeff ever hears this, he's going to love that I met Jeff Myro. Okay. So Jeff Myro had a friend, Sibby Hashin, who's the drummer for the, the original drummer for the multi-platinum selling band Boston. Right. And he said, hey, Ernie, you play, Sibby plays, you guys should play together. I go, listen, let's, you know, let's see, I sold zero million records and Sibby sold like 50 million. <laughs> no, I'm not playing with Sibby. So all of a sudden, Sibby started, you know, I started hanging out with him and he starts calling me, come on, we got to play, we got to play. And I told him no for like six months. And then finally, finally, him and I played. And it, you know, it kind of sounded pretty cool. And he said, he said, he said, wow, this sounds good. I sh- we should get, um, uh, l- let me ask my friend Barry if he wants to play with us. Barry, Barry Goudreau, the guitar player for the multi-platinum selling band Boston. Yeah. So now I, now I have Sibby and Barry <laughs> and me, and Barry and Sibby are like, we need a bass player. Let's ask Archibald, Tim Archibald. The most, the most coveted bass player in Boston that does all the, all the studio work and everything like that. So now we get, we got that, and then oh, we need a, we need a, we need a sax player. Let's get tunes, tunes from the John Cafferty Beaver Brown Band, the movie Eddie and the Cruisers. Wow. Oh, whoa. And then we need a singer. Oh, why don't we ask Brian? Brian Mays from from um, you know all these other crazy bands, Peter Wolf's uh, House Party Five, and all. So everybody. In the band, sold millions of records except for me. Right, and then and then we kind of, but we did it as fun. It kind of just happened. We didn't, and we came up with the name of the band. Sibby and I, we used to we used to drink wine and watch movies together over the phone. <laughs> I know. I know crazy. That, you're a good friend. Yeah. So we yeah. would drink. We'd drink wine, watch movies, this and that. We liked all these crazy, weird horror movies. Right. And and so was like, we need a name for the band. And I'm like, okay. And I started going. He goes, no, no, your name has to be in. I go, no, 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 no. My name is not going to be in it. So we. So I had a piece of paper, and we're writing down all these names. And we're drinking and this and that. And and I, and I fell asleep. I woke up with the phone by my side, the wine done at uh, uh, at. <laughs> the table and a list of all these names with one circled ernie and the automatics sibby wanted to name the band ernie and the automatics and that's how it became ernie and the automatics wow so so then people kind of you know um you know kind of knew i had a band so our first call was to open up for bb king wow first first gig I've never played a theater in my life, and I hadn't played, you know, except for rehearsals for ten years. Yeah. So one thing led to another, and we ended up we ended up going on the road. The last tour we did, we we um, we toured North America with Deep Purple. We started in Canada. Really? Yeah. Yeah. We came down Canada, then went down the East Coast, over to the Chicago, and everything down south, over to Vegas, up to up to California. Yeah. It's funny when you put that in your mind, you know, as a young man trying to make it in a band and then. Well, my job, my, my goal when this whole thing and we started opening up for like my idols, I mean, we were opening up everybody, like every rock guy that came to Boston, we were opening up for and really cool venues. And my, 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 uh, then I said, well, shit, I've always wanted to play theaters. So my goal, I'm a, I'm a battle winner. Sure. I'm not like I like to win battles to win the war. Mm. Like I wouldn't like if I was a war, I wouldn't like nuke the competition. I would win the battles and 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 get there. And and I wanted to I wanted to bring the band across the country in theaters. And that's what we did. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, like I was saying, like it's you know, be careful what you wish for because you might get it, but the timing might be different than you anticipated. Right, and then and then there's nine of us on a bus. Yep. Nine of us on a bus. We're all like fifty <laughs> on a bus, including the crew and everything. And you know, and and we're going and you know, and Deep Purple is staying at the Four Seasons and stuff. And we're at the we're at the the. I learned something which I didn't even know. There's the Holiday Inn, right? Okay. And then there's the Garden Inn, and then there's the something else, and it goes all the way down to like twenty nine dollars a night. Really. Really? That's, you know, know that. so we're pulling into these cities and passing the four seasons. I'm like crying and ending up at the <laughs> Garden Inn. <laughs> oh, that's good. To uh, to jump back to your uh, your your killer property, I saw a video where you had you had built a mausoleum on yeah. your property. Yes, yes, yes. And you you held like a séance there. You know what's funny? 
You know, it's funny. Yeah, well, I held, I held the seance live on the radio. So okay. Some rock station wanted to do it. My, actually, a very good rock station. My, yeah, yeah. I, I love rock. Yeah. Um, some friends of mine are the morning morning DJ, and they, you know, and they know I had a Mosley. They said, let's do a seance on the radio. It'll be fun. And then um, I did their morning show just the other day because they wanted me on because I bought the island. Okay. And they informed me that in that seance, the the girl the seance lady said that i'd be buying an island really and i'm like i don't remember that and they go oh yeah we remember that we remember that so isn't that crazy that is weird uh. are you into into the occult uh well you make that sound bad <laughs> well that, i mean it's, i guess that's <laughs> but technical. no i believe in energy sure i believe in energy i i think that uh you know you know we're going out into you know there's something crazy out there right beyond us absolutely right do you do you follow any religions or well, just I was spirituality? Up, I was brought up Roman Catholic. Sure, I was brought up Roman Catholic, and I, uh, yeah, I, I believe you know that you should be good to your fellow man, and I believe in karma, you know, mm. and I believe in living a good life. You know, so you've pick, have you picked up things kind of along the way through your travels, different different religions, different cultures, different uh, ways. I've spent of thinking. a lot of time in India in yeah. ashrams and stuff like that. Yeah, right. So do you? I I like. Um, I mean, I, I like a lot of the the way they, you know, Indian culture thinks yeah. of that stuff. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. Plus, when you go over there, it's just, <laughs> it's such a shit show. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. No, I, and particularly, um, you know, kind of karma yoga. Yeah. Yeah. Really just using yeah. using your daily life to. Yeah. And uh, Eckhart Tolle. Sure. I have I have two theaters in Boston called the Box Center. One's a 35-seater and one's a 15-seater. And we just had Eck Eckhart Tolle. Really? At, at my theater, yeah. Wow. He was probably one of the first guys I listened to on a CD that kind of got me interested in that. that you type really of... have to listen to him because yeah. I tried to listen to him for years. Mm. And he's such a, he's such a quiet talker and he's and you know but then it's like you know he's funny mm -hmm. the guy is funny yeah and you wouldn't describe a guy like that as being funny right you know what i mean but yeah he's he's amazing amazing right well i think i've i think there's a quote i'm i have no idea who said it but you know run you know as far as in the spiritual game run from anyone who doesn't have a sense of humor yeah you know anyone yeah. who takes themselves a lot too of people seriously that don't have a sense of humor yeah yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah, someone like Ramdas would be easier to listen to. Yeah, Here see, I'm not. I'm not that familiar with, okay. with the people. He's a good like, Boston boy. Is he? Yeah, really yeah. from Boston. Yeah, oh, check him out. Yeah, oh, wow. absolutely. Cool. You okay? So if I, I'll give you a brief history. You'd, you'd, you might recognize him. So he was Richard Alpert, um, professor at, um, at Harvard with Tim Leary. Oh, and they both got fired together for the same. For the same reason. Craziness. Well, oh, he wow. actually got fired and Tim Leary left. Oh, yeah. And then yeah, they yeah. went on the whole yeah. the whole ride together. Yeah, I, don't, I don't really, I'm not like super familiar with your audience, but if you sure. don't know who Timothy Leary is, check it out. Yeah, yeah, I know. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, man, I mean, that's, that's pretty much all I have for you. I really appreciate you taking the no, time. Thank, thanks for coming. I so enjoy coming up here. The vehicles are just, I mean, you have two, two uh, Ferrari 288s. Two! Yeah. Yep. You're lucky to see one in your lifetime. You have two here. Oh, we get spoiled and I get desensitized yeah, here. It's Absolutely. crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely crazy. And you got a, uh, uh, Pantera uh, Mangusta. Yeah. I just bought one. Yeah, Di Tommaso yeah, Mangusta. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just bought one. It's it's being restored. They're good, good, cool cars. They're, They're super cool. You see them way less than a Pantera. You never yeah. see them. Yeah. You never see I was just out in Pebble Beach. The Panteras, they were like, they were like McDonald's cheeseburgers. They were everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're such a good looking car. They are a good looking car. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, was, and they used to be a dime a dozen and, yeah. and, you know, 25 grand all day long. Yeah. 15. I remember 15 and 25. Now a nice one is over 100. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Oh, absolutely. Anything, uh, anything else you want to tell the audience or make announcements or tell them where they can find you? Yeah. I mean, you can check me out at all the socials, Ernie Bach Jr. I'm on, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. There's, I have this, there's the public Facebook and my private Facebook. When I first signed up with Facebook, nobody told me you can only have 5,000 friends. Nobody <laughs> told me that. Right. So, you know, so now I have a public Facebook 
also. And, um, you know, Instagram is cool. Twitter's a rock fight every day. Yeah. Every are you, are you day, in there throwing right? rocks? Oh, well, I'm not throwing rocks. I'm <laughs> ducking. But it is a rock fight every day. I like it. I think it's exciting. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. I just got on uh, Twitter as a, yeah. like a kind of yeah, a spectator. Twitter's good. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, anyways, I appreciate you coming on. We should oh, go for th dinner. Thanks for having me. All righty. All right. Thank you. Thanks, man.